Good day, everyone. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Before that, I would just like to go over a few logistical items. The seminar will be recorded and will be made available on our website following the session. So for that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks who are expecting to attend, your lines have been muted. For questions and comments, we're going to be using the Q&A feature within Zoom, and we would like to encourage you to use that. You can start typing your questions in throughout as they come to mind. And what we'll do is select a handful of questions that we will try to cover at the end of today's seminar. We also want to hear some of your thoughts on flood modeling, so feel free to participate in our Mentimeter poll using the instructions at the bottom of the screen, and we'll present the results a bit later. We have a handful of panelists that will be sharing their work and knowledge with us today. And we're, we're extremely grateful, not only that they're joining us today, but for the tremendous work that they do supporting the community. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And we'll keep the, uh, the QR code and the link up on subsequent slides. So if you missed it, no worries. So my name is Terry Martin. I'm with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, or NAPSIG. Thank you all for joining us for the second in our Emergency Management EM Geo Forum series. This is a part of a virtual seminar series that we are facilitating on behalf of the Response Geospatial Office within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We are partnering to further a shared vision of advancing emergency management through the promulgation of best practices, and the integration of innovative technology and solutions in day-to-day -day operations. We're all very excited that you have joined us for this topic. I know we all have the current pandemic on our minds and I'm encouraged to see so many dial in as we get ready for the upcoming flood season despite our current circumstances. So uh, as registrants, you will receive notification when material from today's seminar are available, as well as information on the upcoming EM Geo Forum dates and topics. You can also check back on our events page for those details and for any upcoming events. I did want to mention that we were developing the series in tandem with FEMA's Modeling and Data Working Group. This is a tremendous group that meets monthly and you're welcome to join those meetings. They cover a different topic each month that we will be working to build on in subsequent months. So they had an incredibly informative meeting in February around the topic of flood. And for those of you who might have missed that, you can send a request to the email on the screen and get the slides from that session. I believe Charlotte's going to be putting that in the chat as well. With that, I would like to turn it over to Chris Vaughn, the Geospatial Information Officer within FEMA, who had really had the vision behind the series uh, to get us kicked off both on the flood topic that we will be discussing today and the vision for the EM Geo Forum series. So with that, over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Terry. And I just wanna echo the two main things that Terry said, which is number one, thank you for joining. Uh, I realize that this is an extremely busy time um, for you all, but we hope that you're going to find the, the presentations today and the, the insights extremely valuable because of the second thing Terry talked about is um, we are dealing with uh, an unprecedented event, that being COVID-19. But as emergency managers, our job is to always think in terms of preparedness, and we are very much thinking in light of what happens when it's not a matter of of if it's a matter of when when or when we get hit with a spring flood what are we going to do so one of the principal things that's that's laser focused in our mind is establishing the workflows and understanding the relationships the interdependencies that we have as an interagency that being um, fema the the national water center usgs uh, this interagency body how do we really pull these resources together? You're gonna to hear that presentation today. You're also gonna be uh, uh, provided with a presentation on, on our thoughts on what do we do if and when, when we get hit with a spring flood and how do we do remote assistance in light of COVID-19 operations. So I hope you uh, uh, appreciate where we're coming from. Our intent with today's uh, presentations is to really put that out there in an open and transparent manner. Uh, we really need your feedback to make sure that we're on track. Um, and thank you once again. Thank you so much for being a part of today's discussion. Back over to you, Terry. 
Thank you so much, Chris. Um, now I'd like to kind of move forward with the, the panelists that, that have joined us today. We have Katie Picchioni, uh, the crowdsourcing specialist with FEMA unit, the Response Geospatial Office, where she works with external groups that crowdsource information and activities during disasters and connect them with relevant internal stakeholders. She also supports remote sensing coordination and runs the interagency remote sensing innovation working group, where she specifically works to build connections across FEMA components that have historically expressed interest in leveraging remote sensing and to work with researchers to develop remote sensing technologies that meet emergency managers' needs. We have Casey Zuzak, who's a senior risk analyst with the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program. He's worked at FEMA for 10 year, over 10 years and has a background in hazards geography and meteorology. Adam Barker is a geospatial analyst in the Response Geospatial Office, where he focuses on integrating modeling results into disaster response. In the past, he studied the flow of water while in a different state. He has a PhD from the University of Washington, where he studied the influence of climate change on glacier flow. We have Matt Welshans, who's a ge geospatial information unit lead for FEMA's National Incident Management Assistance Blue Team. He's been with the FEMA field geospatial unit lead for responses to Kilauea volcano eruption, Hurricanes Florence, Michael in 2018, Hurricane Dorian in 2019, and the Puerto Rico earthquakes in 2020. He also served as the geospatial analyst during the Hurricane Maria response in Puerto Rico in 2017. Lastly, we have Philip Ulbrich, who's worked off and on with FEMA for several years, with stints in between at Engine Engineering Company, New York City Office of Emergency Management, and the log cluster within the UN World Food Program. So as you can see, we have uh, quite a great group of panelists for you today. I wanted to start off with a little bit of a background. Um, for those of you new to our organization, I just want to briefly talk about who we are. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 me members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, and county levels. Our vision as an organization is listed here. At its core, it's to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working toward building a more resilient nation. So this graphic kind of represents how we work towards that vision. A large part of what we do really culminates in delivering a session like today, sharing and encouraging the consistent use of best practices developed by our mission partners like FEMA. So of course you can visit our site for more information and get access to those resources. Our panel is going to be sharing where to go following the seminar for specific content and tools that they use to support the work that they do. So today I just wanted to give you a sense of who we have participating. Um, I think as of this morning we actually had 145 registrants so we've been able to map 132 of them. Um, of those we have a bunch from emergency management with a large representation indicating um, that they are other, which we'll have to dig into as well, uh, a number of public works and utility backgrounds. We have a good mix of local, federal, and state government as well. So listed here are our objectives for the seminar today. I won't read them for you, but we hope you'll leave with a better understanding of the flood models used at FEMA at different phases of a flood event and where you can access those models and outputs. At this time, I wanna go ahead and see if I can share the results of our Mentimeter poll, see if you all have been able to access that. Oh, great. So this is um, where you are looking for models. We have a large, not a surprise for response, um, next in mitigation and recovery. And then what flood modeling products do you use and like? This is great. And as you think of more, please feel free to enter these in. Uh, we hope to kind of uh, curate all of the resources that you share with us today and give them, uh, share them back out with the group. Now, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, before we kind of jump into the models and the data needs that uh, we're going to have Katie Piuccioni get us started um, and help frame some of the considerations for preparing for a flood event that FEMA is addressing, I wanna encourage the whole community to plan for. So with that, Katie. Hi, can you hear me? I sure can. Awesome, um, great. Well, thank you so much. 
I just wanted to, so I'm Katie Piccioni. I work in the response geospatial office at FEMA, where I support our crowdsourcing and remote sensing functions. Um, uh, Terry, you can go on to the next slide. One of the things that we've been talking a lot about at FEMA is what to do when the next disaster comes in a COVID environment, as I'm sure many of the people on this on this call are also thinking about. Um, you know, many of FEMA's programs, everything from response to recovery to, to mitigation and the National Flood Insurance Program rely on field staff, a field presence in some way or another. And the, and the pandemic, COVID-19, presents an, an unprecedented risk, both to our field staff and to the public. Um, so many of our programs are are figuring out how to do the work that they normally do in the field without actually physically being there. Um, and geospatial tools present a lot of options, like infinite possibilities. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the response geospatial office is, uh, is reaching out to support programs um, across the agency as we can, as they are working through plans for how to carry out their mission and carry out the agency's mission and deliver response and recovery and mitigation programs um, in a COVID-19 environment. So I just wanted to talk very briefly about some of the, the things that we're working through internally. Um, I laid out here on this slide, you know, there, there are a lot of things to consider when developing geospatial solutions in a large organization. Um, on one end of the spectrum, you have to consider all the different data types and data sources and, and data collection options that are available. And on the other side of the spectrum, the other end of the supply chain, if you will, um, you need to make sure that, that the policies and procedures uh, that are in place enable the use of those technologies. So uh, there's sort of this matching that happens. And, and on this slide, I've outlined you know, a, a few of the things that we're thinking through, right? Data sources include everything from online forms, um, we have cell phones, which you can use to collect data that are you know, sort of a source of data in and of themselves through an Internet of Things perspective. Um, and then there's also aerial imagery, everything from satellites to manned aircraft to drones um, and model outputs as well, which of which you know, a lot of the flood, flood model products and also the, the depth grids um, are related to, to those data sources. Um, and then you usually you have to do right. Everyone, I think most of the people on this call know that you have to do something to those those the, that data before you can use it. Um, so there's some level of production, uh, whether that's an analysis or you, you know using predictive analytics to create geospatial products or um, uh, uh, working with imagery to make it visible and accessible, viewable, accessible and usable, exploitable in different ways. Um, and so, you know, on the, on the technology side, you have these things. And then on the other side, uh, really understanding the applications. You know, how will these data, how will these different data and technology, uh, geospatial technologies be used? What are the needs from a programmatic point of view? And how can technology support um, the decisions that, that the people carrying out programs need to make? Um, so one example that we're working through, and we've been we've been having conversations with FEMA's individual assistance program about. Um, so the, the individual assistance program provides direct support to individuals who are affected by disasters in the context of floods. That's usually, you know, people whose flood whose homes uh, get flooded or are destroyed in floods and storms. Um, and an example is that we can use aerial imagery um, or flood depth grids or even even flood extent models or flood extent products um, to to streamline the individual assistance delivery so making it easier and faster to get grants out to people without having a site inspector go look at someone's home um, so we're working with our with our individual assistance program to try and, uh, and and figure out the right technology solution to meet program needs um, and terry if you could go on to the next slide i want to talk a little bit about some of the, the way that we're structuring our thoughts as we try and do this matching of program options and, and data. Um, uh, oh, it looks like this, I lost the slide there, but basically we're, we're trying to take a sort of an engineering approach, right? First identifying the needs and then um, going through and, and figuring out, you know, once we, once we understand the needs and the, the real program needs, um, brainstorming the technologies that can support those needs, and then brainstorming policy options that uh, that are viable. 
Um, and from there, we can really work with the people who run the program to develop the, the standard operating procedures and training and other guidance to roll those things out. So um, if anyone has any questions about any of that, or if anyone on here would like to uh, follow up, feel free to reach out. Um, but for that, I'll turn it over to Casey Zizak in the, in the uh, in H yeah, Risk Hazards Program, National Hazards Risk Assessment Program. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing I want to do, and good, good afternoon, noon, everyone. My name is Casey Zuzak, and I'm the Senior Risk Analyst with the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program. Um, is I wanted to introduce our program up front, since we are a newer program with FEMA. We have a long, complicated name and an acronym that is can be pronounced several different right ways. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so our group, the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program, NHRAP for short, um, works together in the FIMA direct in FIMA in the risk management directorate um, to provide a common understanding of hazard consequence hazard consequence hazard and consequence data to reduce disaster stuff suffering and we do that through a number of ways uh, within the upper or within the NHRAP program um, we operationalize a lot of technical information for action um, one thing that is often seen throughout FEMA in a non-disaster time is we produce a lot of hazard information. So we do a good job of mapping where hazards could happen. Um, and a lot of our federal partners do a great job of that as well. The USGS is the international experts on mapping earthquakes, landslides, and other geophysical hazards. The National Hurricane Center does an amazing work on predicting what storm surge could look like and you know, identifying historic events and frequencies of hurricanes. But very few groups actually take that data and apply analysis to it. And that, that's the, what the vision of our group is, is really to operationalize technical information to drive action across the community. If you wanna to go to the next slide. To do that, we've, we've identified three goals of our program. The first is to institutionalize innovative and integrated risk assessment processes to link risk with policy and program implementation. In short, just making data available for decisions. Additionally, we are looking at leveraging partnerships with other groups like the Integrated Water Resources Center um, and the National Water Center, working with the Pacific Northwest National Lab and even other groups within the CTP program on the risk map side of the house to bring together analysis for, for flooding both before, after, and during events. And all of that is done in the effort to produce credible risk assessment, assessment data and then promote our best practices at the end. And finally, we are looking to empower states and local governments and territorial and tribal governments to reduce disaster suffering, to become more of a resilient nation through the use of data and analytics. Some tools that we offer support a lot of these goals like the HAZIS program, the national risk index that we're doing, and then eventually the HAZIS loss library, um, which we should be rolling out later this year. If you wanna to go to the next slide. So specifically today, I wanna to talk about um, the, our support for the National Flood Insurance Program for disaster response. Being in mitigation, we, we have a little bit of a focus on the flood insurance program. Um, any, any person who is looking to have a federally backed mortgage and lives within the special flood hazard area is required to have a National Flood Insurance Program policy. Um, we've also, the program has also shown over time that an insured survivor is able to recover more quickly from a disaster. So we have a lot of vulnerability in a high, a high risk zones. Um, and we also have a di couple of different programs through the reinsurance program where um, we need to have some general understanding and estimates of what disasters and the disaster impact looks like to the specific um, NFIP. So what we do um, for hurricanes, I'm going to use hurricanes as an example right now, is we use HAZIS to support all of, of the wind modeling. So we know 
you know, what the wind speeds are projected to look like when the hurricane is going to make landfall within 72 hours, and we're able to produce estimates. In a hurricane, we know that's only half of the story. The other half is, well, what happens because of flooding, both inland flooding and coastal storm surge. For that, we work with the National Flood Insurance Program and the, on the analytics team to develop estimates. We coordinate with the um, Response Geospatial Office, the National Water Center, and the Pacific Northwest Lab, as well as our coastal engineer and engineers within the Risk Map Program to ensure that we're using the best flood hazard information. Um, and from there, we do some general NFIP estimates and understanding how many policies are exposed to flooding, how many policies are exposed to flooding above certain elevations. And then from there, we um, look at some historic events to understand how those unfolded to come up with damage curves and loss ratios um, to apply to come up with a, an NFIP impact estimate. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, so we do that as the storm's making landfall. Um, and we'll often do a, a final run once we have a hindcast from the Pacific Northwest National Lab on a lot of our work, or if we have an authoritative flood data source um, that comes in. One piece that is critical to our process is work in developing estimates for the flood insurance program is the collection of high water marks. And Chris, thank you for you and your team's effort on always pushing these through for large events. I know that um, they've been around for about nine, we've done the mission assignments for about nine years now, but it seems to be a new hurdle every time. So thank you for always um, supporting the, the collection of the high water marks. The data are um, very valuable to not just your program, but also to the mitigation side of the house. So what we will do is take those high water mark data that are collected by the um, USGS and we will download the, the high water marks from the USGS flood event viewer where as soon as they collect high water marks every day, they upload um, the data and quality check it and it appears in their uh, web application. From there, we're able to download it, manipulate the data to create a water surface elevation and then subtract out the digital elevation model to understand what parts of the community have been flooded and what, what level of inundation does it look like? Is it one feet? Is it two feet? Is it six, 10 feet? Um, those all have different implications into the disaster world. Um, so we take that information and we share back our depth grids with the response community and we make them available on the disasters geo platform. And then that's kind of where we stop. We do another iter couple iterations of the depth grids to make sure we have the most final data available. And we provide final national flood insurance program analyses as well. Um, and the last thing I wanted to plug before I turn it over to Adam is the, the Hazus Fast tool. Um, we've created a way using open source tools within the Hazus program to allow users to get answers faster. Um, and the Hazus Fast tool allows for users to, if they have structured data that's Hazus ready, rather than bringing it all into Hazus and going through a lot of the frustrations of that, if you have the structured data and if you have a flood hazard data piece, we developed this open source tool that allows you to load your structured data, load your flood hazard depth grid and create an output in seconds. Uh, for instance, we ran New York City at, I think it was 40,000 structures in four seconds. So it runs about 10,000 structures a second, which is a lot faster than anything I've ever been able to do in Hazus. So um, I did wanna let you guys know that this tool was available and can be used to support a flood response, especially as we get down to having a, a national structure inventory that we can share. Um, publicly with everyone. So with that, I'll go ahead and if you want to go to the next slide, thank you. Turn it over to Adam Barker in the Response Geospatial Office. All right, so yeah, thank you, Casey. Yeah, so we're gonna switch over to the Response Directorate, which uh, according to the Menti poll is, is the most popular, albeit a small sample size. But anyway, uh, I am Adam Barker. I work in the Response Geospatial Office. Uh, herein, I will refer to it as the RGO. Uh, the RGO sits in the Planning and Exercise Division in the Response Director, as I already said. 
Um, I do want to emphasize, though, that the RGO is not just a, a GIS shop. Rather, we use GIS as our primary tool, uh, and, and with that tool, we integrate a variety of analysis types, including uh, remote sensing, modeling, crowdsourcing, and, and in general, just geospatial analysis, as you see in the slide. Uh, in the RGO, we provide uh, geospatial support and analysis for all disasters. And as people have alluded to, we're currently heavily involved in the, the COVID pandemic. But it's vital for us to not be uh, to not have a singular focus on on, on just one hazard. Uh, and so, while COVID has our immediate attention, we're also monitoring other hazards. And, and last week is a really good example of that. There were a number of uh, highly convective storms that had the potential to produce tornadoes. And we also had a fairly uh, sizable magnitude 5.7 earthquake in, in Utah that we uh, monitored and, and produced products for. Um, but like most people, this time of the year, we're, we're very much interested in flooding. And really with any disaster, our aim is to provide information to address two big questions. Uh, first, how many people will be affected? Uh, and second, what will be the extent of the damage? And so these are our real overarching questions that, uh, that we use to guide senior leadership decision making. Uh, but in the RGO, we support all elements of disaster response, which, which includes uh, supporting our operational and, and logistical partners, uh, including those in the field. And, and simple numbers like the total population affected uh, won't suffice. Rather, we need details about uh, all the affected people, uh, including information about their basic demographics. Uh, we also want to know about types of, of infrastructure. Um, is it critical? Is it um, not critical? That sort of thing. Uh, so these are the, the uh, questions beyond those, those two immediate ones that um, we're also trying to answer. But ultimately, our aim is to provide support for disaster survivors, and we do that by reducing complexity uh, saving time and providing situational awareness. Next slide, please. And so, uh, how do we address these two overarching questions that I mentioned before? Uh, basically, we use a combination of modeling, modeling results and observations. Uh, but for flooding, the key element is really the flood depth grid. And uh, I may call it the inundation product, uh, but just, just keep, I'll try to, I'll try to stay with the flood death grid. Anyway, I do want to make a distinction. So before an event, the depth grid will be mostly based on forecasted data. And because of the uh, inherent uncertainty, we, we generally restrict our analysis to simple, simple exposure estimates. So what's the population that uh, is affected? But after an event, the depth grid will be uh, hopefully based on observations and, and measured data, and it should also be validated with uh, satellite imagery. And so at, at that point, the damage assessments will be made from this more higher fidelity death grid. And so the diagram on this slide shows a, a general workflow uh, of the process after an event. In this case, this is uh, using a, a, we're assuming this is a, an in-house created death grid uh, but we would use the most, author most authoritative one possible, and we've used uh, several products in the past. Uh, for reference, at the bottom, the green boxes show the process in, uh, it looks like we lost the slide. But anyway, the, the green boxes at the bottom show the process in uh, linear steps through time, and I, I've highlighted the in that red box, the uh, determine AOI, obtain data, and create flood death grid. These are the areas that uh, are most critical that we uh, leverage our interagency partners and, and other institutions for, for help. Uh, but going back to the diagram, essentially we would use a water surface elevation that we would create from stream gauge data combined with the DEM to create the, the depth grid. Uh, and the depth grid is, of course, the flood extent, so the uh, spatial extent, and then the flood inundation depth, so the, the amount of water. And the resulting depth grid can be validated with remote sensing, which is what we show uh, coming in on the right. But I, I'd also like to mention that uh, before an event, a 
depth grid created from um, a model forecast can be used to predict the AOI. And so there's this sort of feedback. Um, and with that AOI, we can, we can help with the uh, satellite tasking for Im imagery collection. But once we have the depth grid, uh, we'll intersect, intersect that with the flood extent um, with data sets that contain structure. So on the, the bottom left, the structural data sets. And these are just building footprints. We're, we're talking about uh, enriched data. So it has things like the occupancy types and, and other details. And then once we have this subset of, of affected structures, uh, we can further refine the analysis by using the, the inundation depth, so the amount of water, to estimate uh, the damage using uh, depth damage functions. And so this will yield what we call our, our geospatial damage assessments. And this is a key product that, that we do make in the uh, RGO. Next slide, please. And so this is, this is my last slide, and it really summarizes uh, the needs of, of the response to a spatial office. And I've broken it up between uh, pre-event and, and post-event. And pre-event, what we really need to know is, 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 you know, it's simple. Where will the water be and how much of it will there be? And we need this to be, to be quick uh, so we can, we can do these sort of rapid response predictive flood models uh, and, and to create these products that will assess the impact. And, Ideally, we would have something in hand uh, days before the event. Obviously, this is, this is complicated, especially uh, thinking about her, her tropical storm Amelda. Uh, it's not possible at all at time. But I want people to know that we will absolutely compromise on accuracy and precision just to have something. So a product in hand is, is worth uh, more than, than waiting for something that uh, waiting for some model to converge or something like that. And when I, I mean precision, I mean, we don't need to know the, the exact depth to, you know, 2.3567 inches. Uh, it's fine for us just to know that there's no water somewhere or there's zero to two inches here or, or two to four inches. It could be uh, broken up like that. And really at this stage, the, go the goal is to provide situational awareness. And, and this really goes into helping our, our senior leadership make decisions. So should they uh, allocate a certain amount of resources? Uh, do we need to open up shelters? Do we need to deploy the search and rescue team? So these are our major decisions that are often made uh, starting 72 hours out before the event. After the event, uh, it's critical for us to know, uh, again, where the water is, uh, but it's more important to know how, how much water there is, so how deep is it? And then, uh, obviously, how long is it going to be there? And, and for this, we, we need a, a better product, uh, so something that is uh, validated using observations. And our, uh, for, for your reference, we have to have uh, initial damage assessments done within 72 hours of the event, and ideally, this would be done before that. Uh, and at this stage, the goal is, is really to, uh, again, assess the damage, but to do it in a more quantitative way. And the reason that's important is because we have the direct ability to uh, expedite the declaration process if it's uh, serious enough. Um, furthermore, we can refine resource needs. And, and I, you know, I forget this at times, but the data and decisions we make during response are critical for all of the functional areas that operate outside of the response phase, so mitigation, preparedness, long-term recovery, they all are using much of the data that are collected during the response phases. And, and Casey uh, talked about that perishable high watermark data that, that we mission assigned the USGS for. And, and so these, these decisions happen during this uh, response phase. And so it's critical for us to, uh, to both collect that um, and then remember that uh, we're not the only ones using that data. And so we'll go on to the next slide. That's the end of my presentation. And we're gonna continue with the uh, response, but we're gonna go to Matt Welshans, who will talk about uh, the needs of the field. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, my name is Matt Welshans. I'm the uh, GIS unit lead for uh, FEMA's National IMAP Blue. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use uh, GIS in the field here uh, during disaster response. Uh, and most of my talk's going to focus in on that first uh, probably 24 to 72 hour period uh, when we're in actual true response in larger disasters. Um, so in the field, uh, we will typically integrate with state and other federal GIS teams in larger scale responses. Um, for larger scale responses, think hurricanes, um, large scale flooding, um, those kind of things. Um, when we're in smaller scale uh, responses or recovery only operations, a lot of that response ends up coming from our regional GIS teams or from headquarters. Our main job is really to provide that basic analysis and basic information that gears toward three things, situation awareness, uh, decision making, and future planning. And you'll notice uh, decision making is more along those lines of what's going on right now versus future planning looking down the line about uh, anywhere from uh, three to five days down the line. Um, our main focus when we're on response is three things, life saving, life sustaining, and then property protection in that order. Um, the big thing for response is we always need as much information as possible. We need to make sure that that line of communication is going through whether or not that's um, actual data or uh, model data. Uh, next slide, please. So in flooding, uh, we use a lot of modeling data. And the main reason for this is we're looking at the incident as it's occurring. Um, so all of our modeling forecast data is really a stand-in for that inundation layer that gets generated after uh, the flooding has occurred. And a lot of what we're looking at is just getting size and scope of the disaster. Um, how many people are going to be affected? What infrastructure is affected? Uh, Adam mentioned critical infrastructure and we're modeling that too with a lot of this information. The reason we use a lot of the flooding data is quite frankly, it has a better fidelity than our FEMA flood zones. It, FEMA flood zones only tell part of the story. And when we're looking at an actual flood scenario, uh, a lot of areas that uh, fall, with, uh, fall outside of the flood zones are uh, heavily impacted. So, we use this modeling for uh, basic scenario building, uh, planning factors and areas of concern. And the big thing I wanna emphasize is we're working under pretty tight deadlines. We have to uh, figure out what we need to mission assign, where we need to put uh, different assets, different people out in the field to be able to respond to uh, emerging needs. We also need to look at areas where communities are going to be isolated and where we might need to drop uh, different commodities to help them with uh, life sustaining uh, missions. Um, because of that, we have, um, we have a big need for reliable and rapid timeframes for when this data comes in. And a lot of that is to set expectations for our senior leadership out in the field so that when they're making the decisions, they have the freshest information um, possible. And Adam mentioned this uh, before too, we don't need perfection. That's uh, Perfection can sometimes be the enemy of our process. Uh, what we do need though is when we're in a modeling situation, we need to know what the confidence level is on the data coming in. So if we see scenario data come in or model data come in and the modelers aren't very confident on it, we need to know that so that we can adjust our expectations um, as needed. Uh, next slide, please. So our current modeling suite that we use out in the field, um, initially we rely heavily on the uh, hazardous flood damage model. Uh, this gives us our first estimates when none of the additional data is available to us. So this is uh, in the case of a hurricane or a large rain event where we know that uh, some of this stuff is coming, we can build scenarios uh, with the hazardous team um, and be able to start building in those uh, planning factors as soon as we hit the ground. Uh, sometimes we're out three to five days prior to an event happening. When the event's getting closer, then we'll switch over to um, the uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, RIFT model. Um, this is um, a rapid infrastructure flood tool. Um, and this is something that's emerged over the last uh, probably two to three years. And uh, we've 
had a pretty decent accuracy uh, with this information. During a hurricane, we'll also look at coastal flooding using the slosh model. So this is your storm surge and everything else. And then as the information comes out, uh, once we start getting um, actual data from the field, we'll start incorporating high water marks into our process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some of the things that we have kind of uh, put on our wish list for when we're looking at uh, some of these models. Um, we know that some states have collected some first floor elevations for their building footprints. And this is something that I know is uh, being processed uh, throughout the country. Um, it helps us uh, prevent overestimation of flood damage. So gives us a little more fidelity on the actual impact of an event. So uh, that would be something that we would love to see roll out um, nationwide. We had uh, really good success with that uh, during Hurricane Florence with North Carolina's data. Uh, the other thing is um, a lot of our models um, come in um, raster format. And one of the things that makes that kind of difficult for us is that uh, we can't really do a lot of quick analysis uh, with raster in an online environment, which is sometimes where we have to work in. Uh, so one of the things that we would love to see um, happen is uh, some of this data be converted over to vector format and using some classified values um, that might correspond with some of the uh, information that um, in individual assistance is looking at when they do their uh, reports for major, minor, uh, and destroyed um, homes in a uh, disaster. And the other thing that we're looking at is um, scenario building. Uh, so one of the things that we've uh, worked with National Hurricane Center and a few other people with is uh, developing uh, best case, worst case, and most likely case scenarios and kind of uh, establishing those um, those levels of confidence, whether or not it's a percentage uh, confidence level or just a high, medium, low confidence. Um, that helps us with building out uh, planning factors and developing courses of action when we're out in the field and helps us really get um, a lot of scenarios built for where we need to put forces and where we need to put assets into the field. Uh, pending any questions, that's all I have for this. Uh, I'll turn it over to Phil. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Um, so sort of just to round it out, uh, here, I work for the uh, Interagency Coordination Division, uh, the Long-Term Recovery Group, and essentially what that uh, does is help sort of distill all of uh, my colleagues' sort of previous uh, representations of uh, sort of flood modeling and get that down into the uh, localized or county level. Um, and what that uh, takes place at, um, you know, folks call them charrettes or community engagement meetings. Really, it's implementing uh, this science uh, into uh, actionable items for uh, local planning and uh, capacity building. And next slide, please. Um, so a couple examples. Uh, one is the uh, Louisiana resilient following the 2016 flooding, pretty uh, substantial flooding event um, throughout the state of Louisiana they adopted approach to look at uh, watershed specifically and how to sort of elevate plans associated with uh, impacted watersheds. Um, as most of you know, flooding is not specific to a jurisdiction and follows a more natural pattern rather than a political boundary. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, sort of the principal innovations of this, this uh, watershed based uh, regionalism, um, you know, integrating um, resilience um, and recovery in these support plans, um, and then essentially transitioning all of this information to the state to implement um, in their individual plans. Next slide, please. Um, and the goals of this, uh, obviously to reduce costs, uh, again, to build that uh, state and local capacity, and then um, sort of take those findings um, and improve uh, federal uh, action or participation. Next slide. And so here's an example of uh, the risk viewer. 
uh, for Louisiana. And uh, there'll be links to uh, this uh, at the end of the presentation. And again, this is a, you know, an analytical tool uh, developed by a CPCB community planning capacity building uh, specific to Louisiana. Um, and there is also the uh, CONOPS for the project uh, and the uh, watershed resilience report um, at the end. So next slide, please. Um, and this is taken directly from uh, a local plan produced by the town of Denham Springs uh, in Louisiana, just uh, east of Baton Rouge along the uh, I-12 corridor. And um, they were uh, subjected to that 2016 flooding event. Um, uh, it had, uh, you know, obviously a very large impact on their community and that uh, through um, the utilization of these various flood uh, flood depth products, they took that into account for their uh, community resilience plan. And there should be a link to the um, entire plan um, towards the end of the presentation. And the original uh, photo on the uh, left is from the uh, 1983 um, hazard mitigation plan so that you can see that they updated their, their plan. Next uh, slide. Um, a couple more examples that were utilized in uh, local town and community engagement meetings. Um, these are some examples from upper Midwest flooding um, in Wisconsin. And again, you know, these types of products are, are often printed out and brought to, uh, you know, local community meetings. So, you know, folks um, have the capacity to sort of see, you know, how their uh, town was impacted and they can help, you know, potentially identify parcels that they would vote to uh, have redeveloped in uh, lieu of having their uh, specific areas uh, flooding again. Uh, next slide. And then again, this is an example from uh, Lafarge, uh, again, in uh, the upper Midwest in Wisconsin, same thing. Uh, you know, a large flooding event uh, impacted the uh, small downtown. And so they, um, you know, used this product to uh, help um, solicit input from the community for uh, identifying parcels for redevelopment and actually relocating portions of uh, city owned buildings. And I think pending any questions, that should be it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate all of our panelists today. I know we went through them pretty rapidly, um, kind of from <laughs> start to finish, but we had a lot of really good information that we wanted to get across to you today. Uh, Jared, do we have any qu unanswered questions in the, the Q&A that we need to tackle before we move on? Uh, we actually don't. Uh, all the questions have been answered by our panelists. So if anybody uh, watching uh, wants to look at those, you can click on the Q&A button and click over to answered and uh, all the questions and answers are there. So thanks. Excellent. And if you have more questions that come to mind, please feel free to enter them in there. If we don't get to them today, we do uh, create a copy of the Q&A and add that to the material. So that will be available after the fact. Um, so if you've attended other trainings with us, you may have heard the concept of a geospatial game plan. And this may be more important than ever as you look to how you will ready your organization and GIS capabilities for a flood in the wake of a pandemic. So what is a geospatial game plan? You start with identifying the core information needs by your audience. What are the key questions that they might have? This would be the public, first responders, emergency managers, et cetera. Um, and we'll share the, there's a link here, but we'll share it in the materials uh, to a template to help you develop a game plan for addressing those information needs. And it, it walks you through thinking of what are those core information needs throughout the entire cycle of an event like a flood, for example, and the models and the model outputs that we learned about today, where do they fit in? Do you have them bookmarked and preloaded into your information products? So we know many of your agencies who deal with spring flood were already concerned about the upcoming season and are already working through some of the possible scenarios. And as Katie mentioned, modeling and advanced geospatial analysis for estimating potential impacts and applying those capabilities in new ways uh, for your agency are hopefully forthcoming. So uh, our panelists all mentioned some resources. There are lots, so we've just highlighted some here. Um, and we will 
also pull together the ones that you have included in the Mentimeter uh, for the material. So thank you for everyone who's been adding into, into there. Um, so as Philip mentioned, uh, he's including a, a link to, to the PDF, which is the report from the Louisiana Disaster Risk and Recovery Assessment and some of the other content he mentioned. I also wanted to mention the National Flood Preparedness Guideline. It was developed in support with uh, DHS Science and Technology Directorate and was updated back in 2017 to address the key challenges that some of the panelists really talked about today that flood prone communities face. It includes key workflows and information needs um, for first responders and GIS support staff. Um, and it's not an academic report. It was written specifically for the EM community to share lessons learned and best practices to dealing with some of the most significant challenges. And you can a few examples of what some other jurisdictions are doing successfully right now um, and implement yourselves. Uh, I've also included a link to core information needs. So we talked about this in the previous slide as part of your geospatial game plan. Um, it's a gallery which, where you can filter based on a hazard and it includes a lot of data and modeling that you should be aware of for different scenarios and you can start uh, bookmarking and having ready to go in your information products. We also have a link here to Pin to Flood, which is a web-based app being developed by the University of Texas at Austin Center for Water and the Environment and the Esri Disaster Response Program. And it allows for on-scene first responders to make their own flood maps on demand. So while standing at a water's edge, they can drop a pin and the map automatically returns the boundary of the flood waters along with identifying impacted address points and roadways. At the moment, it only works in Texas, but they are currently working to add additional states. It is based on height above nearest drainage flood mapping methodology. Um, and while it should be used in caution while identifying flood boundaries or making decisions of whether a cell is dry or wet, its applicability as a high level guidance tool along larger rivers is definitely noteworthy. I also link to uh, the POST tool. It's FEMA's prioritization, prior, prioritizing operation support tool. Um, it's a predictive output that displays areas of greatest risk for a given event based on social vulnerability, population, building location and types and hazard data. It's produced from a predictive geospatial model and is based on the best available hazard data. Um, the areas that are potentially at risk and it's run whenever there is a new hazard uh, forecast, for example, from the National Hurricane Center or USGS shake map. And we have a link to the dashboard that's updated following an event as well. And uh, last, also the, the link for the National Risk Assessment Program, which Casey covered. We're sending a link to that main FEMA site, which includes links to resources like Hazus and other resources as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Uh, these are the people that were working in the background, monitoring the chat and adding links. We will be making your, uh, your questions and answers available. This recording will be available on our website. So uh, if you've registered, which you all have, you'll get an email when that is all ready to go. So thank you again to all of our panelists and thank you for attending today. NAPSIG and FEMA all hope that you are stay safe and healthy and visit us next time. Thanks again. <laughs>